a little boy was kneeling by his bed uh, with his grandmother on one side and his mother on the other side, uh, softly saying his prayers before going to, to sleep, praying for God to bless his family and his friends and to keep him safe through the night, to give him another day to live. And then all of a sudden he straightened up and raised his voice and said, and don't forget to give me a bicycle for my birthday. His mother was startled and said, Johnny, you, you don't have to shout. God is not deaf. And the boy responded, yeah, but Grandma is. <laughs> now there's a young man that knows that God doesn't always give us what we pray for. And we should pray for that, to tell you the truth, that God does not give us everything that we ask him to give us. It depends on the kind of perspective we take. When we take the perspective of a parent who is raising little children, if you think about it, when they ask us things, the most common answer we give them is no. Can I have another piece of candy? No. Can I ride my bike in the street? No. And can I play with a loaded gun? No. And when they get older, uh, we continue to give that same answer. Uh, Johnny's having a party. Can I uh, go to his house? Is there going to be beer there? Mm. No. Are the girls going to stay overnight? Mm. No. And we don't say no because we want to diminish their lives, but because we want to spare them of consequences that they'll suffer for a lifetime maybe because of foolish mistakes they made when they were young. In the same way, God does not give us everything that we want because God knows better than we do what we need. Father knows best, as the old show used to proclaim. And only do we benefit by God's superior knowledge and wisdom if we keep the lines of communication open between us. A prayer is what we call that line of communication between us and Almighty God. Our message for today is a primer on prayer. A primer is a, an instruction on prayer. People seem to have a lot of questions about prayer. My brother-in-law used to attend this church uh, before they relocated to uh, North Carolina. And the first time he came to worship, he said, maybe he's a Methodist, I'm big time, born, family goes way back in the Methodist church. And he comes here and he goes, why don't, don't you use trespasses in the Lord's Prayer? People have lots of questions about prayer. Sometimes, uh, what kind of, you know, should I get on my knees to pray like little Johnny did? My, my knees are getting kind of sore. Uh, or, or does God hear the prayer of a Jew or a Muslim? Lots of questions that people, you know, should I pray for uh, myself or should I only pray for the needs of others? Lots of questions that people have. And even Jesus' disciples had questions about prayer. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. Jesus, they noticed, was always praying. He was praying from the moment they first encountered him. As it is written, one of those days Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and he spent the night praying to God. When the morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them. Makes you wonder whether Mr. Trump or Mrs. Clinton prayed about their choice of a running mate. I bet they did. I hope that they did. Big decision ahead of them. Who are going to be partnered with? But Jesus prayed when he called those who would follow him. And his disciples noticed this, that he prayed about a lot of things. And prayed most of the time. It was his custom. And John the Baptist had taught his disciples how to pray. So one of them comes up to Jesus and said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And he did. At first he taught them what they were to pray, content issues. Then he goes into how they are to pray, some procedural things. Let's begin with the content. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. You know, just like churches use different versions of the Lord's Prayer, 
Um, so the Gospels have different versions of the Lord's Prayer. A little fuller version in the Gospel of Matthew. You may have noticed as we read this from the Gospel of Luke, it's a little bit of a truncated or a, a, a little shorter version of the Lord's Prayer that Jesus is using. And, and in Luke's version, he says he doesn't use trespasses or debts. He uses sins, whereas in Matthew's Gospel, he, in the translation I use, he uses, he uses uh, uh, debts. Now, you could preach a sermon on every single one of the petitions in the Lord's Prayer. Indeed, you could even preach on just about every word that's in the Lord's Prayer. In Matthew's Gospel, the first word is our. It's implied in Luke's version, but the word our. Jesus doesn't begin by saying, my father, maybe your father, definitely not your father. No, but our father. As Paul said, one God and Father who is over all and through all and in all. There's one creator of the universe, including all the people in it, whether they're from Ethiopia or India or America, one creator God, one Father of us all. Our Father. You could preach a message on, on a single word. Or the word hallowed, for example. Hallowed means to make something holy as opposed to profaning something. We often interpret this as using God's name in a profanity, which is commonly done. You know, I don't think God has such tender ears that he just gets all uh, bothered so much by colorful language as he does by a deeper understanding of what it means to profane his name. Now, that is done when people presume to know God too well. I know the Lord's will on every whipstick social issue out there. I'll tell you what to believe. We see this in the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the religious leaders of Jesus' day when someone takes God's name for their, their own and presumes to speak for God, but most importantly does ungodly things in the name of God, like crucifying his son. That's when we profane what is intended to be holy. When something is made holy, it means it is transcendent. It is bigger than I am. We approach it with humility and not with arrogance and pride. Your name be hallowed in my life. And, and that's why we must submit to it, not presume to speak for it all the time, but to seek it and then to submit to it. God is the king in his kingdom. His reign is in his realm, his kingdom. And so in the prayer we pray, your kingdom come, your kingdom come on earth in my life as it is in heaven. And that happens wherever somebody submits themselves to God's will rather than bending God to their will. And that's why Matthew in his prayer adds the addendum, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, in my life, as it is in heaven. You'll recall when Jesus was being uh, betrayed, he prayed on the, in the Garden of Gethsemane. He prayed, Lord, if, if possible, remove this cup, take this cup from me. The cup was a, a, a figurative way of referring to God's fate for him, God's path plan for his life to be crucified nobody wants that Jesus is come if it's possible remove this cup but he says not my will but thine be done and it was God's will for him his son to be crucified which sounds like a terrible thing except that the moment he was crucified and died he was plunged to victory as the song puts it he was taken up to the unspeakable bliss of heaven, which makes all earthly trials pale by comparison. But it was through prayer. This is the power and the purpose of prayer. It helps us to discern God's will and, most importantly, to submit to God's will for our lives. It is God's will for us to be wholly dependent upon him, which is why the next petition, the most important word in it, is the word daily. Give us this day 
our daily bread. Because normally what we want is not our daily bread. We want bread for today and tomorrow. We want enough bread to retire in style. We can't get enough bread. The, the, the more we have, the more we want. And the problem with that is that bread, you know, bread is a, we call money bread. Give me some bread, man. <laughs> Bread becomes a God with a little g that competes with God with a capital G for our devotion. You know, sometimes the Almighty wants us to sacrifice a little of that bread on behalf of his other children in need. And if we're so consumed with the business of getting, 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 we may not be able to give when he calls us to give, as he calls us to make sacrifices, and then our devotion has been compromised. We're serving another God, not God in heaven. And so we must seek balance. It's okay to ask for our needs to be met, but a little balance there. The author of Proverbs put it this way. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, Who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. Balance in what we receive from God's hand. The next petition is very clever in a tongue-in-cheek sort of way. There is humor in the Bible. Jesus said, forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. Oh, do we now? Do we now? I think most of us are challenged in forgiving anyone, much less everyone, who sins against us. But here again, this is where prayer enables us uh, to do what we, we can't do and aren't inclined to do on our own. You know, if we have really experienced the forgiveness of our sins from God, we hope that we get mercy in that regard. If we've experienced that, well then, we're going to be able to extend to others the same charity that we want to continue to receive for ourselves. If we can't forgive, if you know somebody who's challenged forgiving somebody who really has sinned against them, I mean, there's no question about that. If they can't find it in their heart to forgive, that's a, kind of an indication that they haven't themselves received God's forgiveness. So we, and if we have received it, we're going to extend to others the same charity we pray to receive ourselves. Finally, on the content side of the prayer equation, Jesus adds, and lead us not into temptation. God leads us. That is a fact. He wants to lead us from the, the land of bondage to the land of promise. Now, in between the two is the wilderness of uncertainty. And once we get out there, we follow God's lead, and we go, hey, now that I'm out here, how am I going to eat? What am I going to drink? Uh, the Egyptians are pursuing me. How are you going to deal with that? You know, and, the, and that is where the tempter resides, is in the wilderness of uncertainty. You remember when Jesus was uh, baptized, and just before he began his ministry, he was driven by the Spirit out into the wilderness where he was tempted by the devil. It is the wilderness of uncertainty, uncertainties in this life, that tests our faith. But temptation, God never tempts us. Uh, we're only tempted by our own disconnect from God. When we take that line of communication and sever it, when we're no longer in prayerful touch with God, uh, that's, that's where, where we get ourselves into trouble. Uh, St. Paul said, No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Oh, but only if we have that line of communication with God. Only if we pray. This is another one of the powers and purposes of prayer is to uh, help us when we are tempted to master our temptation, to master temptation, to trust God to provide for us, to forgive as we hope to be forgiven, to submit to his reign, to hallow his name and not to profane it. So you can see from the content of the prayer that Jesus offers as an example 
uh, that the point of prayer, as Kierkegaard puts it in the quote at the top of our bulletin, is not to change God, but to change the one who prays. Prayer is not intended for us to get what we want from God, but to allow God to get what he wants from us. Now, after discussing the content of prayer, Jesus goes on to the process of prayer, how we ought to pray. And, and he doesn't deal with the superficial things like do you use a rosary or do you get on your knees or do you do it at night or before meals or what, you know, the, not those kind of procedural things. But he addresses the most important thing. He uses two little parables that basically communicate the same thing. The first one. Then he said to them, suppose one of you has a friend and he goes to him at midnight and says, friend, lend me three loaves of bread because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have nothing to set before him. Now in the Holy Land now as then, uh, hospitality is a big deal. If you have somebody who drops in, you're going to put some food before them, give them a place to stay. It's a, it's a big deal, both in giving it and receiving it. Now, this story kind of reminds me of a trip Nancy and I took to the Holy Land early on in our marriage. And we, uh, one of the places that we went to was uh, some village, I don't know which one, do you know, where, where we visited the Palestinian home? Where was it? It was in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem. And the, the, the Palestinians are a poor people, generally speaking, and, and they, they live in these hovels, these earthen rooms, single rooms. And we have a picture of this woman talking to Nancy. She's pointing to her neck. Nancy has a little birthmark on her neck. And this woman had the same one. And all of her kids had it. And so they're pointing it out. She's like, oh, a kindred spirit. Well, we got to look inside. She welcomed Nancy and I come in and take a look at her place. Most of the, the one room and then a big courtyard. Most of the living is done in the courtyard. The cooking is out there and so forth. But at night, they go into the protective enclosure of that room. And when we looked in, we saw there was a... Do you remember what was in there, Nance? Mats. Mats, right. There was a hole in one wall, as big as a root cellar, with a ton of, of like mattresses folded up and stuffed in there. You see, at night, they pull all those out, lay them out, and then they all take a place, maybe two to a mattress, a lot of kids, and, and they close the door and put the, the bar over it so they're protected while they sleep. Well, this... Okay, it's midnight, the Jesus story, and a knock comes at the door, and the guy's going, Dave, are you in there? What do you want? Oh, a friend came out of town for the high holy days. I don't have anything to give him. No food. You got, I need three loaves of bread. He goes, it's midnight. What do you, come and see me tomorrow. Go next door. The guy, the guy is persistent. You know, have you ever had people who won't take no for an answer? Come on. Open up the door. I need something. Jesus said. Then the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. Imagine getting up and go to the bathroom, having to tiptoe over all these kids. And... <laughs> he can't take no for an answer. Jesus continues, I tell you, though, he will not get up and give him the bread because he is his friend. Yet because of the man's boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. And my translation has a little footnote by boldness. And you go down to the bottom of the page and it gives you an alternate translation. Persistence. I, like, I prefer that one. Because of the man's persistence, he will give him whatever he needs. And this is how we ought to pray. Sometimes the issues that we're facing in life are so big and so deeply ingrained, don't expect to go on a prayer walk and have it all figured out by the end of it. Sometimes you're going to be walking a long time and struggling with God, wrestling with God. Jacob wrestled with God, by the way, and wanted a blessing. And he, God made him wrestle for it. And finally, he prevailed and God blessed him. His name was changed to Israel, Israel, which means one who wrestles with God and prevails. Per, be persistent. Don't take no for quiet, waiting for an end. Keep at it. Persistence. That's how you ought to pray. Don't give up. Jesus continues, so I say to you, and this is just a progression, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you like it was to the man in the parable. For everyone who, everyone 
who asks receive, receives. He who seeks finds, and to him who knocks the door will be opened. Open to what? You're seeking what? You're going to ask and you're going to receive. What are you going to receive? You know what we need more than anything, more than bread? We need God's Holy Spirit in our lives, guiding, providing, directing, protecting. God's Holy Spirit is what we need. Jesus concludes, Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give? Give what? Give bread? <laughs> give what you want all the time? No, something more needful. How much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? This is Jesus' primer on prayer. This is the instruction, the content the what and the how that he gives to the disciple who asks, Lord, teach us to pray. Please rise.